Okay, great. So I'm really happy to introduce our speaker today, who is this is Yashar Yassi Bharat. Well, Yashar was a postdoc with me back in Waterloo. Uh, actually, no, it turns out about a decade ago. I was quite surprised. It's been long, because uh, it's been uh, uh, 10 years since we worked together. We did his PhD at the University of Toronto in something extremely mathematical, uh, which is uh, uh, yeah, stochastic network calculus, and I managed to convince him that this really refers to solar panels, not computer networks. <laughs> and he, he, he managed to get convinced, and he did a, a, some really amazing work, uh, and uh, some of the earliest work on using this approach for renewables. And now he's a professor, an associate professor at the Erasmus University in, the, in Rotterdam, where he's in the uh, School of Business, Rotterdam School of Management. But he continues to do very interesting mathematical stuff and applying them actually to energy systems because he's a scientific lead for the Center for Energy System Intelligence uh, at Erasmus University and he does work in data analytics and so on. Uh, and he's got a number of very interesting projects. I know that, uh, for example, Rotterdam, which is one of the largest ports in the world, is aiming to decarbonize completely, which is a huge, huge endeavor. And just to think about that is amazing. And uh, Yasha is actually involved in the planning for that, and maybe he'll touch upon it in this uh, talk today. But um, anyway, it's uh, I, I recall that uh, Yasha and I actually visited uh, Cambridge in 20, 2014 for E Energy, which uh, John Crocroft was actually co leading. So uh, he and I flew in together and uh, still remember that time. So anyway, uh, I hope we will see him again in Cambridge, but in the meantime, uh, go ahead and start uh, Yasha and start Yasha. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Keshav, for the very uh, kind introduction. And also, uh, I wanted to uh, say hi and good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to have this presentation. It actually, uh, it was a coincidence that um, I'm I'm coming to UK, London next week. I'm, I'm visiting London Business School. And I was thinking that, oh, man, if, if it was only one week uh, difference, then I could actually come and have this presentation uh, in person, which would be much nicer. But um, but I'll, uh, I'll see that how it goes. I, and and uh, I really like to see you all in person. And I uh, maybe in near future will make it happen. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, one of um, our projects that's uh, about the role of renewables and how it is reforming and finding its own way as, as a new um, uh, commodity uh, in different markets and what are the possibilities, what are the challenges. And I'm focusing particularly on one challenge that can be turned into an opportunity. Uh, I've asked uh, Anil, who is the, uh, the brain behind all the methodology uh, of this work, to join me and back me up for difficult possible questions. So thank you, Anil, for being here. Uh, this is a joint work uh, with um, Anil and uh, Professor Rebenak. Um, uh, Anil is a PhD candidate and working uh, with Professor Rebenak at KIT. Uh, but it's also a, a joint collaboration with um, uh, Mohamed Reza something at KTH, Kai Pan and Polytechnic Hong Kong, and Derek Wong from London Business School. Um, so let me start with uh, a very brief uh, uh, introduction about myself. Um, I mean, Keshav was very nicely putting it uh, that, uh, that how I ended up in, in energy domain. Uh, indeed, I, I uh, completed my PhD in electrical and computer engineering. I work on network calculus, which had basically almost nothing to do with what I'm doing today. Uh, but then I was very um, lucky to have this uh, uh, postdoc um, uh, period with, with Keshav at U Waterloo. And uh, I was amazed by um, you know how how impactful this research is and and. Um, and how it is technically very challenging. So you can be satisfied in doing something that is still very complicated, uh, but also you think that you're doing something that you, you can see the impact. And that, that's how I thought that, you no, know, this could be my future. And then it started. I, I started to do more and more on, on energy domain and I got more interested in particular um, corners of the energy domain and new projects started. So currently, I'm an associate professor at, at um, 
uh, Rotterdam School of Management, Erasmus University. Uh, but because there are many initiatives uh, at, at Erasmus and also in the Netherlands about energy, um, I've been lucky to to get involved in these initiatives and three initiatives that I'm currently involved in. That's uh, uh, Erasmus Center for Data Analytics and they have different departments and I'm the academic director of a smart city and smart energy. Uh, within Erasmus, the, there's a an uh, an initiative and uh, uh, that that is um, started by by uh, the need from industry, and then there will be uh, more uh, contribution. So it is growing and it is uh, um, uh, kicking off uh, by the end of this month. Currently, it is called Energy Institute. I will be the academic co-lead of. Um, uh, of this energy institute, but it will be renamed, I would say. Uh, and finally, I'm the scientific lead of uh, the AI energy convergence. That's a collaboration between Erasmus University at TU Delft. And, um, and in this collaboration, we try to bring together the, the engineering aspect and also the operation research and, and management uh, into um, a, a holistic view of what is needed for um, uh, AI energy uh, research. Um, my portfolio of research is changing over time, but if I want to show a snapshot of what I'm doing today, this figure basically is a good representation. So the main components of my research is flexibility, energy flexibility, energy market, congestion management, uh, data layer um, of, of energy and system integration. And you see that there are some overlaps between these uh, main components. Uh, the, uh, those topics that, um, uh, that are more interesting at the moment to me, and I'm um, starting to spend time more on, on those topics are flexibility markets. It's a new, uh, newly evolving markets. Uh, the, these markets are, um, already existing, they, they, uh, but very recent. Uh, and in different uh, countries in, in Europe, we have some pilot projects for these flexibility markets. And this is, uh, they want to test that how local flexibility markets can work out to, to extract flexibility from um, um, low voltage and medium voltage levels. Uh, energy data is something that is recently growing uh, and it is incentivized by European Commission, they, they figured out that um, there is a large amount of data that it's being collected and it's, it's actually needed to be used, uh, but there should be some uh, mechanisms behind standardization, data sharing, how, how, what, how do you monetize data, whether you want to monetize data, privacy, security, and many other issues. And, and they, they want to have a, a data safe house for the entire energy domain. Uh, but as you can imagine, there are many different issues with energy data. Um, and with DSOs, if you talk to DSOs, they they um, they don't know what is happening behind the secondary uh, substations level. So to them, what is happening at the neighborhood level is, is really blind. They have no idea. And it is becoming very important. They want to have dynamic congestion management that what's happening at the neighborhood level. But because there is no measurement, they don't know how to do uh, how to deal with it. Some DSOs started to look into smart meter data and then um, a project that what is happening um, collectively at, at uh, uh, secondary substation level. But there are many issues with that because first of all, yeah, it is not still accurate. And second, there are some privacy issues related to that. DSOs are not allowed to use smart meter data. Um, next to that, um, you know, if, if you want to incentivize data sharing, what are the what are the best practices? How how do you set up tariff mechanisms in order to incentivize consumers to share the data? But they should be aware of who they are sharing the, with, uh, their data with to what extent and whether they get remuneration for that. So many interesting concepts are um, uh, uh, associated with energy data. Uh, next to that and also related to is local congestion management. And two uh, big topics um, in the Netherlands are uh, about system integration, particularly about hydrogen and electricity intersection. 
um hatress is a project that i uh i, I got funded uh for that's uh that's funded by by the net by the uh, dutch foundation agency uh called nwo uh, collectively they they have invested or they are going to invest 800 million euros on, on this r d only about hydrogen because they have the ambition that netherlands has the potential to be the hydrogen hub of the europe um, and, and for for different aspects of, of uh, hydrogen uh, value chain and, and supply chain, they want to figure out what are the best ways to, to make it work. Uh, this particular uh, work package that I'm involving in Hydrus project is about setting up the, uh, the value chain and, and market for hydrogen, especially in intersection with, with electricity. Um, Keshav mentioned the, the port of Rotterdam, uh, the, the project that's a horizon project is called MacPy, that's led by the port of Rotterdam, uh, but there are four of the other partners as well. And the, the main purpose of this project is to set plans for, uh, for the uh, targets that they have for 2030, 2040 and 2050 decarbonization. Uh, and in particular, we are focusing on the electricity sector in the intersection with transportation. What are the um, best investment decisions uh, in terms of grid capacity, in terms of batteries, battery locating and battery sizing, and also smart charging. How can you design and operate such a system? Um, the two other projects uh, that are European, um, the Flexus, that's uh, this, uh, district heating, uh, this is in collaboration with Copenhagen. They have two municipalities there that they want to uh, migrate from individual heating to district heating, but in the transition time, they want to see what are the, the, the best decisions that they can make, how they can help their, their citizens. And Come to Heat is, um, is, uh, is a high tier project. They want to implement a local heating system uh, that can interact very closely with electricity. That's based on composite material. That's a very new um, product that they want to use. Uh, and they want to integrate the, uh, the ex uh, excess heat of the data center. Uh, and the location is somewhere close to the uh, airport of Rotterdam Den Haag. So it is very close by. Um, and you see that, you know, that for every component of this closed loop, there is a company behind it that they want to actually implement it. What I'm going to talk about today is, and in this portfolio of my research, is in the intersection of market and flexibility. So you can imagine that that's somewhere here. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm I'm going to ask you to keep your questions until the end of the, the presentation. But if there's any urgent question that, um, uh, that, that about clarity or any, anything that's, that you need to urgently know to, to be able to follow what I'm saying, then please go ahead and, and raise your hand or uh, post your question. Um, so to set the scene and um, um, motivate why we are doing it and why why is it an important um, topic um, for you guys that that might be very clear because you, you are you're working on a similar field but I still I want to throw some numbers to you that uh, to show how how difficult uh, the challenge is and how big the challenge is uh, we see more and more of renewables coming up worldwide at um, a large scale it's central, uh, centrally located or distributed. Um, examples of large scale solar and wind farms are, for example, the solar farm in, in Dubai. Uh, uh, that's supposed to be uh, the final phase to five gigawatt. Uh, and if you, if you don't know what five gigawatt means um, um, to, and to have a, a benchmark to compare the entire Netherlands, uh, the capacity of the entire Netherlands uh, electricity capacity is 35 gigawatt. Um, the North Sea hub, um, I don't know if you've heard about it, but this is a very, very big project. Uh, in the North Sea, there is a uh, there's a part that's called Dagger Bank and it is very shallow water and they are planning to install many offshore wind turbines. 
uh, up to the capacity of 110 gigawatts, uh, the very last phase. And that is, of, of course, huge. This is not going to be only used in the Netherlands. There are other countries that are also uh, involved in this project. But you see that the scale is very large. And you see also these uh, panda-looking solar farms in, in, in China. There are uh, multiple of them, and they're all gigawatt scale. Um, apart from these large-scale centrally located uh, solar and wind farm, you see that solar rooftop and uh, uh, wind turbines in the cities and on, uh, onshore is also growing. Um, but in 2024, the total uh, share of solar and wind in the entire electricity mix is only 15%. But imagine that we are moving and the projections show that by 2050, almost 70% of the electricity generation is coming from solar and wind only. And thinking about the, the consequences that it has, that the, the electricity grid is a very traditional grid that's not planned for such highly variable and unpredictable type of resources. It is still manageable at very low share of renewables. But if you're moving to that very large share of renewable, many things will be affected and needs to uh, be acted upon. To, um, to give you more concrete um, examples, that what are the consequences of different, multi, uh, different stakeholders for, uh, for, for, uh, in the power system? Um, starting with the grid operators. So grid operators are um, basically planning supply demand matching of the entire grid and the investment phase to, and also the operational phase to achieve a, sis, a, a service level agreement of uh, having power cut of less than four hours per year. This is the number that I, I uh, collected from the Netherlands. But in other countries, the numbers and, and the ratio is almost the same. So it is very high level of certainty that you want to still deliver to the uh, users. But if you have 70% of the electricity coming from something that you have uh, that's very valuable, but also very unpredictable, this is very difficult to achieve. It will need a lot of coordination. You need multiple sectors, multiple energy sectors and energy vectors, uh, and by vector I mean energy carriers, to, to coordinate with each other, to, to be able to transfer uh, energy surplus and shortage from each, from each other so that they, they can make sure that you can achieve such high level of service uh, agreement, service level agreement. Uh, you can imagine that you will have more congestion. The congestion is already... Uh, um, uh, observed, especially in the Netherlands, because we, nowadays the subsidies have incentivized people to, to go for electric vehicles. Um, they, uh, and solar panels. So in both energy shortage and energy surplus, they, they see that the, uh, the capacity of the transformers and, and wires are reaching already um, um, even at this low share of um, solar power and, and uh, electric vehicles. So there will be more and more congestion, especially at the local level. Um, and because you're moving away from these traditional uh, uh, energy generators that were uh, generated centrally and in bulk uh, towards more distributed, um, and in small scale generation, you need to reconfigure the uh, the energy network, going from a central uh, and top down network to a decentral and very communicative network. Uh, and all of that will result into the need for more energy flexibility. You need more energy flexibility in different forms and different time scales to be able to still achieve this very high level of uh, certainty. Um, a, a, an estimate of um, by uh, International Energy Agency says that the amount of flexibility that we need by 2050 will be four times larger than the flexibility that we needed in 2021. And uh, this figure 
actually projects what we need to have, what, what are the different type, types of flexibility that we need to have. And this is cumulative hour per year uh, for 2050. And that's, uh, that's a report um, provided by the uh, grid, uh, grid Operator Association in the Netherlands. But you see that different forms of flexibility needs to be combined so that you can still manage the um, the, uh, the high level of uncertainty that, that you will achieve. Um, what is the impact for renewables? So the new investors or the renewable energy providers, what is the impact of having larger share of renewables to them, each of them particularly? So they used to uh, receive uh, large subsidies at the investment phase. But these subsidies are going down. There are less and less subsidies. Uh, and this figures show the, the merit or the curve of the generator um, um, in, in the electricity market. And the, those uh, older renewables, there is actually a negative part that's it's not shown here. There's a negative bar, and that's the negative marginal uh, cost of the renewables with large subsidies. And these subsidies are larger for those that they entered the market earlier. Those that they intermarket later, they will be closer to, to this zero line. So they have uh, less advantage compared to the previous um, uh, renewable uh, in investors. If they want to gain back their uh, investment costs in the, in the day head market, which is a market that you trade your energy, um, they, it, it is becoming more and more difficult and the payback time will be much larger. Like to give you an example, in 2023 in the Netherlands, there were 308 hours with negative electricity prices. So they basically pay you to consume. And so the prices are going down because there are more renewables with low marginal costs and even negative marginal costs. And if you want to get back the, the investment money that you had in the market, it will take way longer. Um, there are also other um, uh, relaxation of, of subsidies, um, even at the consumer level. For example, Dutch government decided to phase out the net metering by 2025. 20, uh, so that, that's reasonable for new renewable energy providers to, to think about other revenue streams apart from the, the very conventional day ahead market. And the third, um, part that, that I want to focus on uh, about how renew renewables are affecting uh, that, that's, uh, that, that is the reserve services. So when you have more renewables in the, in the electricity market, what is happening is that um, there is a, 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 a so-called product that's, uh, that's called the reserve um, service. These reserve services are used uh, as backup when surprises happen at the operational time. So when, when you see that the energy supply and demand didn't match because of gaming, because of misprediction, because of anything, then you need to use these backup services to still make the, the matching happen. The resources that we have available as a reserve service today are most of them are very in, uh, expensive and very polluting. So the most of them are uh, or a big part of it is uh, fast ramp rate gas turbines. And also they're insufficient for what is going to happen in future. Um, in addition to the fact that we need to retire them because we want to decarbonize electricity sector. So they're already insuff uh, insufficient for future need. They are expensive and polluting, and they have also some operational restrictions such as ramp rate and startup delays. So policymakers are looking for other types of res uh, reserve services, uh, preferably without all of these uh, challenges, uh, to fill the need for the for the reserve service uh, uh, flexibility that we need to have in future, uh, and that make the reserve markets the markets where you trade reserve you that you commit to reserve your your um, power to be used if there's any mismatches it's becoming more profitable and more attractive so on on the one side renewables are creating this um, uh, problem to the market that you need more reserve services 
But on the other side, these reserve, reserve markets are becoming more attractive. So, and that brings me to this um, um, slide that where there is a, an opportunity of more profit, um, why not renewables use this opportunity themselves? Because apart from the fact that it is becoming more profitable, um, renewables are also good product to be using these mar markets because they are cheap, they are clean, they are green, uh, they have less operational restrictions, and they are largely available. And uh, it's sort of using the the, the problem for its own uh, uh, solution. Uh, but the main hurdle to to this um, uh, fact is that reserve markets, because they are backup system and that they need to be available uh, and to be activated if needed, uh, they need high reliability of the products that are being traded in these reserve markets. Because if you say that I will give you this product, this power uh, reserve, and you can activate it anytime, I want to be sure that if I want to activate it, it is always available which is very difficult for renewables because of the nature that they have, that they are unpredictable and they are very uncertain and they are very variable. You don't have renewables at all time. Um, so the, the challenge for the renewables themselves is that it brings financial risks to the renewables if they want to participate in the reserve markets. Of course, reserve markets prices are very attractive, but if you miss out the opportunity the, 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 um, uh, to, in, in, to your commitment, then the penalty costs are very high and that is a financial risk to the renewables. Uh, and from the grid operator's point of view, this is a reliability risk that they want to have reserve portfolio to be very reliable. But with the, if we want to allow that renewables also participate, then it will be very unreliable. And that's, that's against the nature of reserve services. And the possible solution that, um, uh, that that one can think is either to back up renewables with storage, such as batteries, or to back it up with financial hedging to intraday markets, which is you know, to, to allow them to buy and sell uh, in, the, in the markets that are happening very close to the time of operation, so that, you know, that if, if you know that you cannot commit to what you are providing, you're, trade, you're trading it beforehand when it is very close to the time of operation from other resources, and that's still fine. And, um, and the, the, the question uh, that, that we raise as a research question arises here, that whether this is a possibility. But to make it more concrete, I want to first focus on two types of products in energy, mar in energy markets. That's one is energy. Energy is the amount of electricity that you use uh, or you generate. Um, and you can think of the, an average household uh, in the Netherlands is having seven kilowatt hour uh, of, of energy usage, the, the, the total amount of electricity that you use. And power is the, the, the speed at which you use uh, electricity. And for, for uh, uh, an average household, this is 11 kilowatt. So if you compare it to these two numbers, you see that if I keep on using the max power, then I'll end up having 264 kilowatt hour per day. So, which is really not the case. And that shows that the peak to average ratio is pretty high, even for the consumption. Um, different products, power or energy are traded at different levels of the market. So if you think about the electricity market and how it is, uh, set up, it's a multi-stage market. Uh, reserve products are being traded before the, the operational day. Uh, so you, you commit as power, you commit how much power you can provide for, for how long. Um, and then on the day hit market, you trade energy, say that how, how much energy you have per hour of the next day. Then the next stage is intraday market in which you you can adjust your, your day ahead bit. You can say that, no, I, I have this much energy available 
at the delivery time. So you have a better understanding of how much energy you'll have at the delivery time. And then after the operational time, if there's mismatches, then the reserve uh, products will be activated and the financial adjustments will be applied to the activation. And if there is mismatches between your end day ahead and intraday uh, commitments, then the penalty will be also applied to you. So the question that we raise here is that can renewables commit power uh, in the reserve markets and back it up with intraday market trading. Uh, and of course, they will be um, paying still for the um, uh, for the adjustments. So would this portfolio, uh, a profitable portfolio for renewables and a reliable portfolio for grid operators? Uh, and this raises uh, the our three research question. Then can hedging tool uh, including batteries and intraday trading, be uh, the enabler of renewables participating in reserve markets profitably and reliably for two different stakeholders. And what is the role of hedging instruments? So as think about storage as a physical hedging instrument and ID trading or intraday trading as a financial hedging instrument. Do we need both of them? Do we need one of them? Which one is better? And one of the core focuses of this work is comparing the two different um, intraday structures that we have in Europe, which is uh, a, a discrete auction mechanism versus the, the continuous uh, uh, market. And there's a very fundamental difference between the two, and we want to see that which one works better and as, as the enabler of uh, for renewable participation. Um, and uh, and in in that portfolio of these three market stages and with and without storage, we are going to to build the uh, um, the, the um, revenue portfolio of renewable um, uh, energy producer. So again, we have three stages. The first stage is the reserve market. There are different types of reserve markets um, at different time scales. We are here focusing on the first or the primary reserve market in Europe, it is called uh, FCR, uh, Frequency Containment Reserve Market. Uh, and this works as the following. In the, the day before, uh, you participate in an auction-based market. This is pay as bid. For every, let's say, four hours, this is in case of Germany, for every four hours of the next day, you can place one power bid, one price bid. So you say that how much power you have for this market time unit, each each of these bits. So you can place one bit per market time unit. And market time unit in case of FCR is almost four hours. So you can say that for the first four hour, I have this much power available and I'm willing to, uh, to commit to this power with this price. And then there will be an auction. And if you are um, cleared, you have to make sure that you have that much power available. Whether or not it is going to be used, you have to keep that much, that much power available. The FCR market is symmetric, which means that winners need to reserve power in both direction, whether upregulation, which means that you, you need to generate with that power, or downregulation, which means that you need to consume with that much power. And then you have so suppose that you have committed to that that much power in the reserve market, then you can back it up um, in the intraday markets. Intraday markets are energy markets, but there, as I said, there are two main different types of um, intraday markets. Discrete um, auction intraday markets, that is the market that is used in, for example, Spain and Italy. Um, the way they work is that you have multiple stages. At each stage, you can bid per market time unit. Market time unit in this case is smaller than the market, the market time unit of uh, FCR market is uh, 15 minutes, for example, in, in the case of uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the coordinated uh, uh, intraday markets uh, and compared with four hour market time unit in, in the FCR market. So for every 15 minutes, you can say that how much energy you have available and what is the price that, that you are willing to, to sell. Um, and 
Uh, you can do that when you're in building stage one, you can do it for every 15 minutes from uh, the lead time. So this, this would be a couple of times after the bidding time up until the end of that operational day. And then there are some other bidding stages. So you can, in the next bidding stage, you can correct your bids for uh, after the lead time for everything that's happening after the lead time uh, up until again, the end of the day. And this continues for multiple bidding stages, uh, which is five to six, depending on the country. In the continuous market, um, you you can uh, place bid anytime you want for any operational day up to a very small lead time, which is um, 15 minutes, let's say, or five minutes. And at any point in time where there is a match, and this is pay as bid, this is not auction. So you place your bid, whether sell or buy. And then when there is a match on the other side, then you'll be matched. You don't need to wait until the end of, so there is no closing time until that, that lead time. Uh, and you know the matching, whenever there's a match, you will be coupled and you will be cleared. Um, and so the, this will give a trade-off between the continuous market and the discrete market. In the discrete market, because there are there's auction and everyone is bidding at the same time, the prices are more attractive. The market is more liquid. Uh, but what you're missing here is the high level of uncertainty. Yes, you get higher value for, for the energy that you provide, but you have less information about how much energy you have available at the time of operation. Uh, in the continuous market, that's the opposite. You, this is less attractive prices because uh, you will because not everyone is bidding at the same time, so you will miss out at some opportunities that might come up later or before, um, uh, and you will be matched at the first time that the matching is happening. Uh, but you have less uncertainty because you can wait until five minutes before the operational time. So you pretty much know how much energy or power you have available. And that's the trade-off between these two. Um, and the last stage, so you have the reserve market stage where you uh, commit to the power, and then you have the intraday market where you um, uh, try to match it up with the energy commitment. And then the last stage is the imbalance stage where any mismatches between how much you committed and how much it is realized. Uh, it is, it's an automatic uh, market. You, it's, uh, basically, there's no decision to be made. Um, and uh, But any mismatches will be adjusted financially to, to your portfolio. Um, and if you want to model it mathematically, in, um, in the first stage in the FCR market, uh, suppose that you are a renewables with, and you're risk neutral, you're a profit maximizer, and you have an unbiased estimation of future generation. Uh, you want to commit to some power, you don't know the future market prices, you don't know your future availability, and your decision variable is the, the power commitment that you want to have and the price bit. And you want to maximize the overall uh, expected profit. This is stage one. Stage two to M, depending on the intraday market, you know how much power commitment you have placed in the FCR market. Then you want to um, place your intraday bids, which is in the case of discrete market, that would be the, inter, uh, the energy bids, how much energy you want to uh, commit in the, the intraday market. In case of continuous market, you also need to place the price bid because it's pay as bid. Um, and your objective is to make sure that the overall expected profit is, is maximized. And in the, the whole portfolio, you should think that you have renewables, which is by itself a, 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 an uncertain generation, uh, but you also have next to it batteries. Um, and so there are some operational decisions to be made here as well. And the final stage, the imbalance stage, the generation and the uh, prices uh, and the activations of the um, um, reserve markets will be realized. Um, and then, you know, the, the whole uh, problem is, is complete. Uh, the type of the problem we are dealing 
here with this, these three stages is a multi-stage stochastic mixed integer program. And uh, we have decision-dependent probabilities. And the, and the master problem, and the FCR market problem is a non-convex uh, problem. Um, the, the way uh, um, we solve it, and by we, I mean Anil, uh, it's, a, um, uh, it's a double decomposition. So in the master level problem, we are dealing with a non-convex mixing integer linear problem. Um, and in uh, the, the FCR market power bits and, and price bits are re realized, and then it will be fed to the sub problem. Uh, where we are dealing with a multi-stage stochastic linear problem, that's the intraday market decisions. And here uh, we are using an SDDP and we are doing these iterations until a convergence uh, uh, happen. Uh, here, yeah, I'm going to skip this because of the interest of time, but if you are interested to know more about you know, the, the methodology and, and the details of it, please reach out to, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we can share the, the manuscript with you. Um, I want to jump into the numerical examples. Um, we assume that we have a renewables, uh, a renewable form of 150 megawatt capacity and the possibility to use 150 megawatt hour battery storage. Uh, we have um, six different portfolio. We assume that you have renewables with battery that you can participate in FCR and intraday market, uh, or FCR, sorry, FCR and imbalance market, or FCR continuous ID and imbalance market, and the third one continues uh, the FCR and discrete ID plus imbalance market. And the same things with the renewables without the battery. And we, we intentionally, we, we create these six different portfolio to see the impact of each of these hedging tools and, and to compare. Um, and we create three different uh, profiles. Um, um, the first one is we are focusing on profitability. And what you see in the x-axis is that F means it's full, uh, full portfolio. We we assume that you have all the batteries, you have, you have all the market stages, uh, and we compare the the continuous ID market, what you get there, and what you get in the discrete ID market. Uh, and the other um, uh, items, you, when we see um, uh, ID, that means that we are excluding ID trading. B we are excluding battery. R E we are excluding renewables, and F C R we are excluding uh um reserve market trading and we see that what is the impact on the profit this is in the absolute term and the right figure shows in the um uh, percentage term as compared to the full portfolio what this figure shows is that uh, the discrete id market and i want to recap the, the difference between discrete id market and continuous market continuous uh, id market is that discrete id market is uh, more liquid, more attractive in prices, but less certain in uh, availabilities. Um, it brings more profit to the renewables than continuous ID market. The full portfolio is more profitable in the, uh, under the discrete ID market. But if you look closer, what we see is that in discrete ID market, the share of uh, reserve market profit is much less than ID trading. And most of the profit is actually coming from ID trading or intraday trading and batteries. So yes, it has larger profit when we have discrete ID market, but it is because of uh, mainly uh, using batteries and arbitraging in the ID uh, um, trading. And it's not because of uh, more participation in the FCR market. In the continuous ID market, what we see is that the share of reserve market participation is more uh, uh, more tangible. It's, it's close to um, the profit that they make in the uh, intraday uh, trading. And most of the profit is actually happening uh, because of the, the combination of ID trading and uh, reserve market trading. So this combination brings most of the profit so battery is only bringing 3% additional revenue. And you can assume that you can remove that 
without affecting that much of profit. In the discrete ID market case, you could remove basically reserve market trading and you only lose 4%. Um, the second portfolio we want to focus on is uh, what happens in the, uh, the quantity of reserve market trading. Because if you only care about how much uh, how how actively they are participating in the reserve market uh, trading on their two different types of discrete uh, discrete and continuous ID trading and with or without batteries, then it is important to look at the the uh, uh, the volume of FCR market tra uh, trading, and what we see is that in in under full portfolio, they participate in the FCR market with the maximum capacity that is possible, of course, within this, this numerical example. But what is interesting is that in the intraday market, if, if you re uh, remove the intraday market, uh, the, the participation of uh, 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 under the continuous ID market is goes very uh, little, it's uh, almost one-tenth. Whereas with the discrete ID market, that doesn't change. And the opposite is true with the battery. And what it means is that under the discrete ID market, uh, reserve market participation is mostly incentivized by batteries and not by intraday trading. Whereas in the continuous ID market, uh, reserve market participation is mostly incentivized by ID uh, trading and not the battery. And finally, with the reliability, what we see is that in both uh, intraday uh, markets, the reliability doesn't change that much by FCR participation. Uh, but what we see that's interesting is that it it's um, it's better that you only use one of these uh, hedging tools, either intraday markets or batteries, but not both. Because once you have both of them, uh, what is happening to, to profit maximizer renewables is that they use this portfolio to make more profit and it is um, happening in a way that it is uh, hurting the reliability. Uh, but if you, they have only one of those two hedging tools, um, the participation remains the same and the reliability is, uh, is higher. So that brings me to the takeaway messages. What does it mean? Uh, renewables can participate profitably and reliably in the FCR market, at least theoretically with uh, looking at the numbers. And these numbers are uh, empirical numbers that we got from um, uh, 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 German electricity markets and also the coordinated FCR and uh, intraday markets. Profitability and reliability highly depends on, on hedging tools. Among all of these hedging tools that we considered, two different types of intra, uh, intraday markets and batteries, we see that continuous ID markets is the best enabler of reserve market participation. Um, and under continuous ID, what we see is that there is no need for batteries because that brings both the profitability and FCR participation. Under discrete ID, what we see is that battery is the main enabler and not the ID trading. What does it imply to renewables? It means that when allowed, use FCR participation in the portfolio, especially in case of continuous ID trading, you see that this is a big part of uh, the profit. Uh, under continuous ID markets, batteries don't help that much for, for profitability. So it's better that you focus on renewable. And if you want to invest more, invest on renewables, but not adding battery to, to that portfolio. Uh, in under discrete ID market, basically ID trading is the uh, most profitable part. Uh, but if you want to consider also reserve market participation, then batteries are essential. What does it mean for grid operators? Uh, there, there is this uh, uh, discussions on continuous ID market versus discrete ID market. Which one is better? I mean that's. That doesn't conclude, but this, this work doesn't conclude that continuous ID market is better because there are many other things that you should consider when you want to choose which one is better. But in terms of renewables, uh, 
participation and incentivizing them to participate in this reserve market, continuous ID market looks to work much better than discrete ID markets. Uh, and what we additionally see that under continuous ID market, uh, it, it's better that um, we, uh, we discourage the use of batches because we see that the reliability goes on. Whereas in the discrete ID market, it is important that, that we encourage the use of batches. Otherwise, we should not allow renewables to, to participate in the market. Um, and this is basically where we are now. Um, and that, that concludes what I wanted to, um, to talk about today. And with that, I want to return it back to you. And I would be happy to take any questions if you have. Thanks very much, Ashkar. Okay, questions to anyone? Um, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to understand at a high level uh, the, the 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 discouragement of using batteries in the uh, in the FID markets. So so if you're mixing non-renewables and renewables, um, surely it's always better to have the batteries there. So the batteries themselves don't have to be used, right? They, they're 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 there as a reserve. So is it the case that you're uh, you're saying that if you actively use the battery supply, that it's a it's a bad hedge, versus the existence of the batteries um, for 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 other for other kind of uses such as um, hold, holding off a coal plant firing up, for example. Yeah, that that's that's a very important, interesting question. Um, there are a couple of things. So first of all, as you said. Um, Suppose that everyone and the, the the market is a central market and there is no distributed decisions to be made and uh, there's a, uh, um, a a market operator which has goodwill and use the batteries in the most efficient way. If that is the case, then of course having more hedging tools that's that's always helping the market. Uh, it makes it more reliable. It it makes it uh, the the reserve uh, products to to be always available when needed if you have the, the batteries. Uh, but what is happening is that in the in a market where uh, market participants are merely a profit maximizer, they don't care about what is the outcome of the market. Uh, if the market is not designed fully efficiently, then um, the decision of the uh, of uh, of the profit maximizer decision makers are not necessarily aligned with what is good for the market. And that's what we see here as well, that the profit maximizer renewables, they use batteries for their own good to increase their profit. And increasing their profit is the opposite of bringing more reliability to the system. If you uh, monetize reliability highly efficiently, then they should be aligned that um, more reliability is more uh, unreliability is more costly and this should be transferred to also market participants. But because the, the markets are not fully efficient, they, they are misaligned. So that's one thing. And the other thing that I wanted to also mention here is that um, even in the case that markets um, uh, are centrally controlled. Um, we see that batteries are not always um, useful. There, there are cases that the batteries are hurting the market. Uh, uh, a good example of it is that uh, you might think that batteries always bringing down the the total carbon emission of the uh, of the market, uh, but even ignoring the the embodied carbon of the of the battery manufacturing just assuming that the battery is an ideal battery and there was no carbon going into the battery to to be produced just the operation of the battery in the market can increase the co2 emission of the overall market um, so there are also uh, some complications some subtleties that um uh, in the market batteries are not always useful Right, thanks very much. Just one clarification then. Um, sure. Should I think of regulation as forming a more efficient or less efficient market? 
because regulation for reliability will result in uh, obviously profit maximizing not being the goal. And so that will then impact which strategy to use, right? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, uh, I repeat your question to, to make sure I understand it. So you say that what is the uh the regulation to make uh is there any regulation to make the market more efficient well, well it's just that this will not be a, free, uh, a, a like an entirely free market because it's an energy market and right security reasons and you know city reasons why it should stay like that so um any regulatory influence from governments will result in that market being efficient with respect to the regulation but yeah, yeah. Maximizing, it's not maximizing profit uh, and, and therefore changing the effect of batteries. So I'm just curious where regulation you know, fits in, in into your thinking. Yeah, the, uh, the, true. That um, ideally they want the market to be fully deregulated, uh, but uh, because of the the technological changes in the market, um, the the market is seen as as a, a is in in the transitional mode, and in the transitional mode. There must be some regulation in place so that it, it can make them or push the market in the more efficient way. Um, so there are regulations, and you know, if, if you focus on what, what we observe here, we can propose some regulatory uh, uh, aspects that can help the market to move into that direction. What 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 should be the market structure, market mechanism that aligns these two objectives together? We can come up with those regulatory perspectives. Um, but there are also many other issues when we talk about wholesale electricity markets because geopolitics plays a big role. That there are cases that you have the best capacity available uh, that can benefit, uh, but you you still don't open it up to neighboring countries, and there are so many of such cases. So it's not as simple as uh saying theoretically what is working there's so many other issues some of them are highly okay. political that governs how the markets are, are working but yeah. there are yeah the european commission and also the 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 market uh regulators always come up with, with new rules and new proposals and same here we we have yeah. listed some regulatory perspectives as well thank you very much that was a wonderful talk and a, and a, and a really good clarification right thank question. you thank you I'm sorry, but we have to go because there's a departmental event that starts like two minutes ago. <laughs> so I have some questions for you. I will send them to you by email. But uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thank you.